book of Exodus. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Oreb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here am I. Then God said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. God said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their suffering, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God said, I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is God's name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. God said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. Before I begin, I can't help but saying how nice it is to have you guys back in worship again. I really miss you during the summer. You're fantastic. Yay. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So according to one of the world's preeminent living poets, David White, certainty is overrated. Certainty is overrated. It's because if we really want to live uh, into most our lives most fully, we have to cultivate a very healthy relationship with the unknown, with the uncertain. Otherwise, what we'll do is we'll continually edit out reality to fit into the little story boxes we've constructed for ourselves about how life is supposed to work and who we are and who God is and all these things. We need to break out of those stories because life is a lot bigger than our conceptions of it, such that when something happens that does not conform to that, that story, we say, whoa, if this is true, then the story I've been telling myself about the way life works or how God works or I work cannot be true in its totality. I need to find a bigger story, one that can include this new reality. Or we can just simply hide our head in the sands and pretend we never saw that, that side of life. Right? I think that's why, one of the reasons why we're in so much tumult in our world today is because for the better part of the last century, if not more so, so many new things have come into our world that it's shaken up the stories. We're all searching for stories that are large enough to contain these new realities that we are experiencing. And it's hard. And some people are saying, heck no, I won't go. You know, that story I learned as a kid or in Sunday school, that's enough to stand for all time. But is it? No, if we really want to cultivate a a full and productive life, a happy life, we need to be able to allow our stories to be shaken 
so that when we can expand into that greater story, our lives uh, come, come with it. In this respect, religion does us a disservice when it promises us certainty. I mean, have you ever noticed that those whose faiths promise the most certainty, they tend to be also the most frantic and hysterical people you know? It's because every new challenge to that, that certainty upsets the whole thing. It undermines their whole conception of life, and that theoretically is not supposed to happen. I mean, I have a theory that those who claim that the Bible presents to us the plain, clear, certain word of God have never read the Bible. Because if you read the Bible from cover to cover, you'll know that it only answers one question plainly and clearly. That is the question, is there anything, is there anything else that is certain about life besides death and taxes? To this, the Bible plainly and clearly answers what, are you kidding? I mean, as followers of Jesus, we can't even, we can't even count on the death thing, right? Resurrection. So not even that is certain. No, the Bible throws certainty on its head. If you read the Bible from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, you find something extremely interesting that every single one of the heroes of the Bible, without exception have had to cultivate a deep and abiding relation and healthy relationship with uncertainty and struggle. You look at Moses, Abraham, Mary, David, Esther, Peter, Paul, even Jesus had to cultivate this relationship uh, with, the, with the unknown, uh, with the uncertain. That's what made them who they are. So take, for instance, Moses. I mean, I feel sorry for this guy. I mean, you heard the story. I mean, first of all, God appears to him in the form of a bush that is burning but is not consumed. Just let that sink in for a moment. I mean, until Moses encounters God in this way, he could certainly have been certain about two things. One is if a bush is on fire, it burns up. And second... Bushes don't talk. <laughs> so already, God is blowing away his certainties from square one. And then when God does give him a clear and plain message, that is, confront Pharaoh, the most powerful ruler on earth at the time, and tell him, let my people go. I mean, I know the Pharaoh family does not appreciate that story very much. Let my people go, right? But, I mean, Moses is like, well, if I'm going to come back to my people and, and tell them we're supposed to do this, you got to at least tell me your name. What, who is, what is the name of the God who is telling me this? To which God responds, eh yeah, asher eh yeah, meaning I am who I am. Oh, Thanks. I am who I am, says, let my people go. <laughs> now, technically, you can translate the Hebrew as, I will be who I will be as well. I don't know if that clarifies things, does it? I mean, do you think a God who appears in the form of a speaking bush that is burning and not con con consumed, who answers to the name, I am who I am, gives a hoot about certainty? <laughs> no. Not at all. In fact, if you read the Bible from cover to cover, the, you find another thing which is, that's interesting, which is the only people in the Bible for whom certainty is a high value are the villains. From the serpent who tempted the original couple to, uh, to be able to paint the world in black and white, good and evil, be certain about what's good and what's evil, to uh, Pontius Pilate who, knowing Jesus is innocent, still sends him to the cross in order to be certain he can hang on to his power. No, it's the villains who want certainty. It's the heroes who cultivate a healthy relationship with uncertainty. Why? Because David White is right that, that when confronted with something does not, that does not fit into the little story boxes we construct about who we are, who God is, and how life is supposed to work, we are challenged then to find a larger story that can contain this new reality. A larger story that fits more perfectly into God's own story 
And when we find that larger story that fits with God's story, our lives come with that expanded sense. We find a story that's large enough to live within and freely rather than that constrains us and continually constricts us as more and more realities have to be edited out in order to, to be safe and comfortable within our, our little boxes. Now this principle works not just for in the realm of religion and philosophy, it works in all kinds of areas of life. Take science, for instance. I mean, think about Copernicus. When his mathematical calculations strongly suggested that the sun does not revolve around the earth, but vice versa, he had a choice to make. He could either hide his head in the sand and pretend he never calculated that, or he could find a new story to describe what he saw was clearly going on. A larger story that fit more into the story, God's story, of what's really going on. And of course, not everybody accepted that story. And nevertheless, it didn't make it any less true. And of course, as the year after year and century after century of scientific discoveries has gone on, we realize that Copernicus' story, the story that he expanded, was still not large enough. That as more and more discoveries have taken place over the centuries, we, our story has expanded beyond the solar system to the far corners of the universe. And even when we got there, now we're asking, well, is there just one universe or millions? I mean, this is a very large story we live within. And chances are the story that you and I have constructed to describe all this is too small. And oftentimes it becomes so small that we lose our freedom to move around in life. That's when God sends us things that break the story apart and invite us to find that larger reality. Some of you... Um, know the story of when I first got into ministry in Scottsdale, Arizona, and, and uh, there was a, a, a couple, an 80-year-old couple who was, um, had drifted apart from the church, and somebody suggested, well, you know, I, maybe they could use a pastoral visit. I thought, oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, I'll, I'll go visit them. So I went to their home and sat with them, and yeah, they said, you know, we, yeah, we're just not that involved anymore because there's just so many things going on at our church. It's just hard to keep track of it all. We just kind of, we just kind of grown disconnected, and well, I made the mistake of buying that line as if that was what was the, really the, the case. And I said, oh, well, you know, I, you know, I've got a solution for that, you know. You know come to a, a Bible study class, you know, um, because, you know, the, the Bible studies here are really the heartbeat of the church. And you, and you just through studying the Bible with, in community with others, we also, you know, kind of get keep in touch with all the other things that are going in the church. So you'd really feel like you were connected once again. The man looked at me straight in the eye and he said, Eric, I would never go to one of your Bible studies. I'm like, well, tell me more. <laughs> he said, well, it's not because I think you, you don't, wouldn't teach me something true. It's actually precisely because of that reason. I am 80 years old. I do not want to learn that something I have believed all my life is untrue, even if it is. Yeah, I kind of found that a little bit outrageous too, kind of funny, but then I realized, wait a minute, I'm not that different. I may not be 80 years old, but I don't exactly go rushing out to, accept, to topple the apple carts of my you know, perceived reality either. And if you were to tell me that, that you had incontroversial, incontrovertible, whatever, really solid evidence that, that, that the fundamentalist version of Christianity was the correct one, that, that the, the cosmos is just 6,000 years old, it was created in six days, and the Bible is the literal, inerrant word of God, I would not exactly rush to, to attend your Bible study, <laughs> right? I, uh, really? Yeah. I, even if I thought it would be true, it would be hard, I'd have to gather up a lot of courage about that, you know, and, or how many of us sitting here today on the tri-faith commons, what if um, there was I very solid evidence that, the tri that our participation in the tri-faith initiative was not God's will? Yeah, now you're feeling it? <laughs> yeah, that would be a little, take some courage to, to try to figure out a new reality based on on that, wouldn't it? 
Now, breathe easy. I'm not about to present anything that I think controverts that reality. In fact, uh, my strong suspicion uh, is that the story that's being created right here with the help of the Holy Spirit is one that is meant to expand and expand and expand all of our stories and well beyond Omaha. What's happening here is meant to expand our stories and our lives around along with it. The 10 years from now, we'll be looking back at the stories we're telling ourselves about why we're here. We'll realize that's right, but we had no idea how really big that story is.
from Acts. In Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of the Italian cohort, cohort as it was called. He was a devout man who feared God with all his household. He gave alms generously to the people and prayed constantly to God. One afternoon, about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he clearly saw an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. He stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? He answered, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa for a certain Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. When the angel who spoke to him had left, he called two of his slaves and a devout soldier from the ranks of those who served him, and after telling them everything, he sent them to Joppa. About noon the next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while it was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the heaven open and something like a large sheet coming down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners. In it were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. Then he heard a voice saying, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. The voice said to him again a second time, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times, and the thing was suddenly taken up to heaven. Now while Peter was greatly puzzled about what to make of the vision that he had seen, suddenly the men sent by Cornelius appeared. They were asking for Simon's house and were standing by the gate. So if you scratch below the surface of most anybody's life, you find an interesting thing that, that, that most of us actually struggle with uh, wanting to have uh, an encounter or get too close to God. That that's, got, that's scary to us. We kind of hold God off. We kind of resist getting too close. Maybe we like to go to church and stuff, but we don't want to get too close. Uh, and that's because, partly I think, because of an intuition we all have uh, that one day we will meet God, and God will see us for who we really are. And that when God sees us for who we really are, will see us for who we really are. And we have the feeling that, that we'll see not, not all of it will be good. That, uh, you know, we know we've done bad things. God sees it, we'll see it more clearly than ever. And we also know that probably a lot of things we think are good and right in the light of God, we'll see that, ah, uh, not so much. And so we kind of think, well, if I'm going to experience this shame later, why, why do that now? <laughs> I'll just keep God kind of close, but not, not too close. I don't want God to disrupt my life with that. Um, I actually have the feeling that, that we, when we, if we do stand before the throne of God, so to speak, and I, I do think we will, I do think we'll face God one day, the, that will not be the hard thing to look at actually. Um, what will be hard to look at, harder to look at, is all the good and right things that God um, that, that f uh, sent, to, that filled our heart with joy, uh, to, you know, a path, paths to go on, that, that lit us up inside, but that we didn't take because it didn't fit into the story that either we ourselves held or because of the story that we were taught by society. All those things that lit us up, we said, ah, nah, it doesn't fit. I, I'll take this other path. So, for instance, there are people who uh, are lit up with love towards another person, but uh, th their church or society has taught them that's not the kind of person you can love. Or they feel directed toward and, and joyous towards following a certain vocational path, uh, but society or their parents or what have you have said, no, that's, that's not appropriate to your station in life or you'll never make enough money or what, whatever it is. Uh, you didn't take that path. Or people who uh, hold a belief about God that is actually good and accurate, uh, but their faith community has taught them, no, that's heretical. And they have died concluding that they were the problem, not their church. 
all those things where God, sent, the Spirit sent us those intuitions, those feelings, those sensations of joy, and we said, ah, I can't fit it into the story, or there's too many people whose story that won't fit in, and I don't want to deal with that conflict or whatever, so I'm not going to take that path. We just kind of wasted our time here, realizing we could have lived this life more joyously, more confidently, just more grandly in relationship with this God who, who, who is not so much concerned with all the dumb stuff we do, but is trying to bring us into the joyous and the great stuff to do. Now, this is why I think developing a pr an active prayer life and living in community with others who are doing this is so vitally important. It's, you know, we, 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 we connect with those intuitions. We learn to trust those, those intuitions. More importantly, we learn to live into them. All those good and right things that don't fit into the stories we grew up with or don't fit into society's story, but are part of God's story that is so much greater than any of our stories. That always topple the apple carts of somebody's story box reality. Well, some people you know, say that, you know, if you're going to be a strong person of faith, uh, that's going to restrict your story. That's going to restrict your life. You're going to become increasingly narrow and rigid and constrained. And yes, that can be true. That certainly bears itself out uh, in many people's faiths, right? I mean, people say, oh, Johnny has a really strong faith. No, Johnny doesn't have a strong faith. Johnny has strong certainty, which is quite different from faith. No, to be part, to develop an active prayer life, to be in community with others who are serious about following the Holy Spirit, I cannot conceive of living life apart from those two things because they always challenge my own story. And what results is a larger story, a story that's closer to God's own story. And if you think what I'm suggesting itself is heretical, that we just ch keep changing these stories to be, be greater and greater like this and, and, and moving beyond smaller stories like this from our, even our tradition, think about how our tradition itself in the Bible characterizes what it means to be a person of faith. Aside from Jesus, the preeminent story in the Bible about what it means to live into God's story is the story of Peter in Joppa in Acts 10 that you just heard. There is Peter on the roof, praying, 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 good on him, praying. <laughs> and he's getting, later he's getting hungry, but he keeps praying, good on him, keep praying. But then uh, he's getting hungry and hungry and praying and praying. Suddenly God sends this vision to him, you know, this blanket coming down with all the animals that are specifically prohibited in the Bible to eat. They're literally called an abomination to God if you should eat them. They're called non-kosher, right? And God, he hears the voice of God saying, Peter, light the grill. It's time for a barbecue. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> I mean, he, Peter is a good Jew, right? Now, remember, all the Christians in the early days were Jews. They considered themselves Jews who accepted Jesus. They did not at that time think that Gentiles were okay this was only a religion for Jews who accepted Jesus, which meant you followed Mosaic law. Peter, like any good Jew, knew, therefore, that the book of Leviticus says, you shall not eat the camel because the camel chews the cud but does not have a divided hoof, but you can eat the cow because the cow chews the cud but does have a divided hoof. Makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Well, <laughs> or you can eat salmon because it lives in the sea and has scales, but you cannot eat lobster, crab, scallops, shrimp because they live in the sea and they do not have scales. Those are non-kosher. Well, all that non-kosher stuff's on the blanket. Peter says, I can't do it. I'm a good Jew. Uh, and the blanket goes and it comes back. Three times and three times he hears the voice of God saying, that which I am calling clean, are you calling unclean? Now, we may think, you know, what's the big deal? A little crab, not a, good, not a bad thing, you know, right? But, but consider Peter. 
he ha- in order to actually engage in that kind of activity, he would have to literally break from a thousand years of not only religious tradition, but the Bible itself. This little thing that we think is a minor ripple, Peter would have experienced as a giant tsunami. Right? And plus, bear in mind that God does not speak with like a clear voice like, like, you know, like this. God speaks through the intuition. He's getting intuitions inside him. I mean, how is he to be certain that this is really from God? If not, he's probably thinking this is from Satan, right? So Peter's just like really worked up about this. And then there is a knock at the door, and there are a group of Gentiles out there saying, we've got this Roman military commander we serve. He wants to know about Jesus, and he's heard about this guy named Peter. Is he here? Well, Gentiles, there again, it's kind of like the blanket thing. Gentile, I mean, Peter, Peter knows full well you know, the, his tradition, you do not associate with Gentiles. The book of Nehemiah even says to the men, divorce your foreign wives because they may corrupt you with, with their pagan gods and goddesses. All these injunctions not to associate with Gentiles. Now Gentiles are saying, hey, can you come with me? Can you come 30 miles away to meet with Cornelius? And suddenly Peter gets it. This vision was not simply about clean and unclean food. It was about clean and unclean people. The people I have declared clean, are you to call unclean? That's the message Peter gets. And so he goes. He goes with them the 30 miles to Caesarea, meets with this Roman military commander. Remember Romans, killers of Jesus, you know, those, you know all that stuff, pagan yeah, he goes and meets with them, and he meets, and as he's telling them about Jesus, the whole, it says the Holy Spirit came upon them. And not only did Cornelius want to be baptized into the Christian faith, but the entire household wanted to be baptized. Well, you just don't do this as, as a God-fearing, Jesus-following Jew who's following the Mosaic law. In order to become a Christian in their day, you had to be circumcised, you had to follow the kosher eating, all that stuff. They say they want to be baptized, and and Peter does it. And when the Jerusalem council hears what Peter does, they call him right in, saying, what the heck were you thinking? And I can imagine Peter responding to them in the same way he responded to Cornelius, uh, the, the same message he gave to Cornelius. The message translation of the Bible has it, sets it uh, best, I think, because Peter fairly exploded with his good news. It's God's own truth. Nothing could be plainer. God plays no favorites. It makes no difference who you are or where you're from. If you want God and are ready to do as God says, the door is open. The message God sent to the children of Israel that through Jesus Christ, everything is being put together again. Well, God's doing that everywhere among everyone. And Acts 11 says, what he does conclude with the church council is, listen, I saw the Holy Spirit descend upon these people. These people were full of the Holy Spirit. Was I to block the Holy Spirit? And the council got it. He said, yeah. We, like you now, are going to actually work this into the story. Which meant breaking a thousand years of history and scripture itself. The early church believed that the Holy Spirit is our guide and our witness. The Holy Spirit even trumps your story. It trumps our tradition story. It even trumps scripture in order to create a larger story. One that does not throw out the scriptural story, but instead sees the scriptural story as the beginning of an ever-expanding story rather than an end of a static one. And if Peter hadn't done that, if the church council had not done that, we would not be sitting here today. Or rather, we probably would be, but God would have found somebody else who would respond to the joy in their hearts instead of stifling it. Peter chose the joy. And in so doing, he lived as fully as a human being could possibly live, I suspect. He chose the joy. 
So to bring this full circle, I believe that what we are experiencing on the Tri-Faith Commons here is very much a continuation of this old, old story of faithfulness, of what it means to be part of a living tradition rather than merely being traditionalist. The traditionalist says the old story stopped, started and stopped then. A traditioning congregation says that was the start of God's ever-expanding story. What we are doing here is part of the Holy Spirit's work in our world that's not just taking place here but all over the world right now. Interfaith relationships where people are clearly seeing the Holy Spirit working at pe in, within people that were traditionally concern, considered enemies. And we saying, if the Holy Spirit is at work at these people, are we to block the Spirit? And we, when we say, no, we will not block the Spirit, we allow the Spirit to, to expand not only our story, but the world's story. Now, I cannot be certain, but I predict that if we survive the coming centuries as a human species, they will look back at what we are doing in, here in little old Omaha and other places around the world where excellent work like this is being done. And they are going to be saying, seeing very much more clear than we are, that we are living at a time of biblical proportions. And that we and Peter and the church council in Jerusalem, we are all of the same species of believer. <laughs> that this is, what's going on now is no less than a revolution like Peter and the early church experienced. You are right in the heart of the heart of it, and so am I. I cannot be certain of this, but I suspect they might even say that we who are alive today witness nothing other than the second coming of Christ. Only Christ incarnated not simply now as a single person, but has millions and millions of people that may just include you and I. Not every new story is a good story. Not every new story corresponds with God's story. Hitler said he had a new story right? Not a good story. The way the Christian tradition has always judged what is